I'm Karen Rubin. Today we're going to talk about inbound marketing and WordPress. Um, I work at HubSpot, which is a company that believes heavily in inbound marketing. And uh, what I'm going to let you know is I am an inbound marketing pro and I'm a WordPress noob. Uh, WordPress and I, we got acquainted a couple months ago. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is we're going to talk a lot about inbound marketing. And then at the end of each of my sections, I'm going to ask for, and I'll, I'll talk about tips I've gotten from other people, things I've learned about WordPress, but I'm also going to ask for you guys, because I know we got a lot of WordPress uh, experts in the house, and so I'm going to ask for tips and thoughts from the audience at the end of each section, so if you're thinking about things like, oh, I know how to do that easier and I don't say it, be prepared to share. Um, and also, I know it's the end of the day, it's 3.30, we're all getting a little bit tired, but I can promise you, there's a slide in this deck that talks about bunnies and social media, so it's worth, you know, hanging around. And at the end, I'll recap everything, so if you do fall asleep, just wait for the last slide and I'll you know, give you the quick hits of what you need. So, marketing's changed. The way we need to market our business nowadays is different from how businesses were built 50 years ago. And the reason this is happening is because traditional marketing, outbound marketing, interruption-based marketing, things like television ads, radio ads, cold calling during dinner time, uh, spam, direct mail, all of that's becoming a lot harder. And the reason it's becoming harder is because as consumers, we've started blocking the interruptions that come into our lives. So we're blocking interruptions. We've got TiVo so we don't see advertisements on TV. We listen to our iPod so we don't have to listen to radio ads anymore. We've got caller ID and the do not call list so we're not getting those cold calls. We've got spam blockers and pop-up blockers online so we don't have to see the advertisements. So as consumers, we've changed the way we want to consume information. We don't want to be interrupted anymore. And that means a lot of traditional marketing tactics just aren't working the way they used to. The good news is there's an alternative, inbound marketing. And inbound marketing is the idea that instead of interrupting your prospects, your leads, the people you're trying to sell to, when what they're trying to do, you create a lot of really amazing content, you get it out online, and when they're looking for information, they'll find you. They'll come and find you when they need to, and you'll be less annoying to them, so maybe they'll buy from you. It involves things like creating a lot of content, optimizing the content, promoting it on social media, and then the ever important converting it and getting those leads so you can sell. And we're going to talk about the five key steps for inbound marketing success. Sound good? One of the good, good things about this is that marketers that use inbound marketing tactics have 62% lower cost per lead. So inbound marketing saves money too, which is something we all enjoy, right? The first step is to create content. And since this is WordCamp, I'm gonna assume we've all bought into the idea that blogs are a good thing. I don't need to convince you of that one. Uh, but creating content is really important to an inbound marketing tactic and to getting found online. The thing is, it's not just any content. Oops, wrong slide. The reason it's really important, this is a new presentation, so you guys are getting it the first time, sorry about that. Um, the reason it's really important to create a lot of content and be online is a recent report came out by Google. 84% of decision makers do research online to guide their purchasing decision, 84%. So when you wanna buy something, you're looking to buy a new car or a new plugin for WordPress, whatever it is, you go online and you do research there. And that means as a business, you've gotta have information there for people to find. The thing is, it's not about the normal content you used to create. It's not about pamphlets that you take to trade shows. Google values sites with a lot of original content. Information, research, in-depth analysis, thoughtful values, uh, thoughtful analysis. They want you to really say something different, be compelling. That means it's not about your product. It's not about your widget. It's not about you, all right? It's interesting information that people are going to find value about, about your industry, about you know, information they need to know. And this is really challenging and something you have to focus on. The good news is there's tons of different kinds of content. The blog, which we're gonna talk about a lot today. Blogs are great. You can also have video. You can do pictures. You can do presentations. This will go up on SlideShare after this and it'll be content that I create to go online. Podcasts. We've got ebooks and white papers and webinars. All of this comes together to be the content that you can create to be part of your inbound marketing strategy and draw people to you, to become that magnet for your industry. So today we're gonna to focus on blogs, because this is WordCamp, 
And uh, there's some cool stuff about blogs that they really help you. And one of the first things I tell people to do if you're just getting started with creating content, you know, you can do videos and ebooks and webinars, but if you're just getting started, a blog is the perfect place to start. And one of the reasons is that companies that blog have 434% more index pages than companies that don't blog. And you might be like, Karen, why do I care about how many index pages I've got? A couple of reasons. Every index page you've got out there is another chance for you to get found by the search engines and found by people searching on search engines. So they're really valuable to have a lot of pages. But having a good number of pages also indicates to Google and Bing and the search engines that you're a real site. You're not just a 10-page brochure site. You've actually got real content going on. And so having a lot of pages is really helpful, and blogs help you do that. Likewise, companies that blog have 97% more inbound links. And inbound links are really important because an inbound link on the internet is like a vote, a recommendation. It's basically someone saying, I'm linking to you and Google or Bing. When I say Google, I mean all the search engines, but I'll talk about Google mostly. Uh, Google is looking for the links on the internet and the number of inbound links coming to you helps them determine how much authority you've got as a site. And they look at the number of inbound links coming to the sites linking to you to determine if the sites linking to you have a lot of authority. And this helps determine how high you rank in the search engines. And so having inbound links is important. And if you write a great blog, there's a lot of content for people to link to. So we've talk we're going to write blogs. Blogs are great. You want to create a lot of content. you got to go one step further. You want to make sure that content is well optimized. Having well optimized content is really important to help it get found on those search engines. There are 152 million blogs out there. It's a lot of blogs. And you can start writing a blog and add your voice to the cacophony of the internet. But the fact of the matter is, unless you tell, mm, unless you optimize it really well, it's not going to bubble up and get found as easily. There are two kinds of optimization. There's on-page optimization and off-page optimization. On, off page optimization is things like getting a lot of links. So that's where you create great content, you make people want to link to it, it's compelling, it's remarkable, they want to link to it. On-page optimization is stuff that you want to think about with your blog and with the pages and how you're actually building those pages. And so there are a couple of things we want to focus on um, with this. And there's tons of information about on-page SEO. I'm going to hit a couple high-level ones. Page title is the first thing. And page title shows at the top of your browser. It's also, if you see the nice uh, search result here that shows from Google, the page title is the internet marketing blog, so it's the big text that someone sees with your search result. You want to make sure that the page title is something that people understand, that's going to be clickable, that people want to learn more about. Uh, a lot of people have home as the page title of their home page. That's not doing much for you when it shows up in the search results. The next thing is you want to have a clean URL, and it's really tiny up there, but it's hubspot.com black slash internet marketing company. It's not a series of numbers and a long, you know, crazy string that nobody really knows what it means, except a computer. It's nice and clean and easily understood. The other thing are headers, and these are the big orange texts on this page, but basically headers are H1 or H2 tags, um, header tags, and they go in the code of your, your page. They indicate to Google what the important content is on this page so that they can see, all right, this is the stuff that's really helping me figure out what this page is about and what it should rank for. So you want to make sure you have a couple of headers, and again, they really tell a little bit about what the page is about. And then the last thing is your meta description. Meta descriptions don't actually impact your ranking all that much anymore. That's the theory anyway. Um, but they're really important because they show up in those search results. And so when you're looking at search results and you're seeing what's there, that page title and that description, those are the two snippets of information that you get to give someone searching to let them know what this, page, what this site is and if they should be going there. So it's important to make sure you've got a, a meta description that kind of draws people in and makes them want to click. So those are some of the on-page elements. As you're writing your blog post and thinking about what your page title should be in your meta description, you want to think about what keywords they're using. And this is one of my favorite stories about my father-in-law. Um, he was a prostodontist. And uh, I imagine many of you, like me, don't actually know what a prostodontist is initially. Um, and a prostodontist is the dentist that fixes your mouth if you break it. So you get in a car accident or a bar fight or whatever and all your teeth get broken, they rebuild your teeth and make them look beautiful. Now if I needed a prostodontist, I would not go into Google and search for prostodontist. I'd probably go and search 
cosmetic dentist, right? That makes sense. My father-in-law hates the idea that people would consider him a cosmetic dentist. He thinks that, you know, it's too much like plastic surgery and it's optional and it's, you know, whitening your teeth and filing them down and doing all that stuff people do. And that's not what he does. He rebuilds people's mouths. And so he hates this term. But when it comes to search engine optimization, it doesn't matter what he cares about. It doesn't matter what he wants people to call him. It matters what people actually go to Google and type in. Because they're, they don't know what a prostodontist is. They're gonna search cosmetic dentist and those are the terms you wanna rank for. So when you're thinking about your blog, when you're thinking about the posts you're writing and the words you're using, you should do a little bit of research and find out what keywords your audience actually uses. Not the keywords you want them to use. Those are different things. And so this, uh, you can do research, finding out things like monthly searches, um, finding out how difficult it would be to rank for those words. It's a really good idea to get a list of, you can start with 10 keywords that you want to try and rank for, that you want to think about, working them into your blog titles, working them into your meta description, working into your posts. Because if your website, if your blog is talking about those keywords, you stand a much greater chance of showing up for those keywords in ranking. So making it all work with WordPress. There's a lot of information about how you optimize your site, what you do. Um, for optimization, there are a couple plugins that have been recommended. The all-in-one SEO pack and Yoast will allow you to do things like easily customize your page titles and descriptions, um, decide what you want them to be, if you want them to be you know, something with good keywords or something different. Well, you always want it to be something with good keywords. Um, keyword research is a little bit harder. There's a free Google keyword tool that they use for AdWords that'll tell you monthly search volume. Um, and if you just Google Google keyword tool, um, you'll find great information there. There's some perfect pay tools. This is something that HubSpot does as well. SEO Raven's another company that specializes in some SEO tools to help you with keyword research. And then I haven't tried this, but I've been told that the Yoast SEO plugin does keyword testing as well, um, but I haven't tried that one out. Anybody else have suggestions, this is the first time, um, suggestions of other things you can use for optimization, um, making sure your blogs on WordPress are really um, SEO optimized? Yeah. Naming file names with keywords, absolutely. So when you're, when you're going to put up a file on your blog, making sure that that file name is something that has your keywords in it instead of something that you just made up like attachment 457921 or screenshot XYZ blah blah blah, giving that a nice name. Same is true with images, when you're putting images up there, giving them a good name, and there's something called alt text which you can attach to images um, to help make sure that they're getting a little bit more SEO credit because search engines can't see an image. It's one of those cases where a picture is not worth a thousand words in the world of search engines. Excellent, thank you very much. All right. So you've, you're creating your content, you're optimizing it, you're throwing it out there in the world. As I mentioned before, 152 million blogs. That's a lot of noise to get through. So you can't just throw it out there and hope people are gonna see it all the time. You need to promote it a little bit. And you gotta nurture your content and you wanna help it get found. And social media, oops, there's my mic. Social media is the best way to go about doing this. Um, I did some research this week just for this presentation um, and I was looking at our customers who are blogging and I looked at like 17,000 blog posts and I found out that blog posts that right after they were written that were automatically shared on Twitter and Facebook got 160% more page views than blog posts that weren't shared on social media. That's pretty cool, right? So an easy thing to do, just push your content out into the social media sphere after you write it and you'll start to build more page views and get more people to come find your site. The thing about it is you want to promote everywhere. You want to get that content and get it out as much as you can. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Stumble, Dig, Google+, whatever works for you, whatever social networking sites you're using, you want to share the content out there and let people know it's there. Now, we all are busy people, right? We don't have time to work on every social media site in the world. Uh, so a couple of tips. Figure out where your prospects and leads are. Do a little bit of research and find out where the community that you need to get engaged with lives because you just don't have time to do absolutely everything. And that'll help you find the right people and focus on those social networks. The other thing is, depending on how you're, what metrics you're looking at and what matters most for you, I can tell you from the same research I did earlier, sharing on Twitter is more likely to get you a lot more page views. Sharing only on Facebook is more likely to get you a lot of comments. 
And so if comments, if you're trying to drive engagement, if you really want to have a good community and conversation going, Facebook's a great place to share. Because people on Facebook are generally a part of a community. They understand that. Twitter is less likely to get comments on your blog. People are communicating about it on Twitter. And so if you're worried about page views, if that's your number one metric, Twitter's a great place to be. Facebook, if you're doing the other thing. However, when I talk about how to do it on WordPress, there are tools that help you and they just do it for you. So I would go for both. So the other thing about promotion is it's not something that one person has to do. Social media isn't just for marketing anymore. Everybody's using social media and chances are there are a whole bunch of people in your company, if you are a company, using social media. And so one of the things we do at HubSpot is we ask the rest of our company to help promote content that we're coming. And if any of you follow a number of people from HubSpot, um, you're probably really annoyed by this because when we put out a new piece of content, there are 300 tweets about it. But it works really well because every individual that works at HubSpot has a, a following and they don't all overlap. And so we send out an email, not for every blog post we write, for the important things when we come out with a big video or a webinar or a really important piece of data that goes up on the blog. And we give what's called, a, we call it a lazy man's tweet, which is basically 140 characters that people can copy and paste into their Twitter and just send out. And so you make it really easy for them and you allow them to share it. And here we go. This has become social media, is because social media is like bunnies. Wait for it. You start with two bunnies, right? And then all of a sudden you've got five. Before you know it, there are 10. And then you're overrun by bunnies. And let me explain. With social media, you write your blog post and you push it out on Twitter. And it's going to all of your followers on Twitter, which is amazing. But what gets even cooler is when all of your followers retweet it and share it with their followers. All of a sudden, you've reached a whole network that you couldn't reach on your own. And these are the compounding effects of social media that make it amazing. It's better than an email. If you send an email out to people telling them about your blog, they might forward it on, they might not. But the whole idea behind social media is that it's really great for sharing. And so you get these compounding benefits because it's so easy for people to spread it to their network that you reach a lot more than you could reach on your own. Thank you for laughing at my bunnies. So what that means is you want to encourage sharing. You want to help people share your content. You want to encourage them to do this, and you want to make it really easy for them. And one of the ways to do that on your blog, you can see I've got it highlighted in orange over here, is including those social, sh social sharing buttons. We've got Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google Plus here. And what that allows your readers to do is click one button and easily share this on their social network. Again, reaching viewers that you couldn't reach on your own because you're making it easy for them to do it. So on social media, there are two kinds of sharing that you should do. The first one is publishing your content to social media. The second one is making it really easy for your readers to share it with their networks on social media. So when it comes to doing this in WordPress, basic sharing standard, and it works really easily, and you should definitely make sure that's going. Um, in order to allow your readers to share more, uh, more easily and with a huge variety of different social networks, Share this, Shareaholic, uh, WordPress Socializer, great plugins. But they basically will allow you to pick from tons of different social networks, social networks you've never even heard of, and allow people to easily share via them. If you're also not sure where your audience is and what social networks you should be joining, you could go look at these for a list of different social networks out there and do some research. Because legitimately, there's so many social networks that they allow you to share with that you've never even heard of. For publishing and share, Network Publisher is a good one. When you're writing your blog post on WordPress, it gives you a little box where you can say, yes, I want this to go out, or no, I don't want this to go. It lets you customize the blurb that will be sent out to Twitter or Facebook, however it will be posted. And so there's some customization you can do there that's really helpful. And tweet old post is really cool. If you've been blogging for a while, the content that you're pushing out there really easily is the stuff you're writing today. The fact of the matter is, you've got all this great evergreen content or older content that you want to get out there as well. What Tweet Old Post does is you can set a time limit and you can say two posts older than this can get retweeted and they'll get pushed out there on their own without you having to do anything. So it's really cool if you've been around for a little while and you've built up kind of a backlog of posts. Um, and at a HubSpot we've done this with some of our content and we find that pulling up some of that great content that's still really relevant, that's still really uh, remarkable for people but they don't see because it's buried under years of blogging is a great way to drive people into your site. Mm -hmm. Anybody have things to add on this one? Things that I'm missing about how you can use social media and uh, make it more effective for sharing?
Yep. Twitter feed. All right, and does that help? Excellent. So Twitter feed will automatically put your posts on Twitter, and there's something similar for Facebook as well. Excellent. Anybody else? All right. Oh, yeah, there's one over there. You just pass the mic because I won't be able to hear you. <laughs> I was just curious how you feel about contests, like tweet, retweet contests, you know, giveaways. Those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely try it out and see if it works. Uh, and measure it is the big thing because you can do these contests and, you know, please retweet this to win money or we just did one on Website Grader, which is one of our free tools where if you tweeted your Website Grader report, you got entered into a drawing for $100. Um, and every day for 15 days, we gave out $100. We measured it and it actually, in this particular instance, it didn't do a lot for us. So I learned that I'm not going to do that one again, which is why I say to measure it. But we've done them before and had great success with it. Um, I had a lot of success with, if you retweet it, you'll get in a drawing to do a guest post on our blog, um, which is interesting. People really wanting to blog about their own stuff. So yeah, I'm all for trying different things. Just make sure you can measure it to know if it worked for you, especially if you're giving away money. All right, excellent. So now we've created great content, right? We've We've optimized it so it can get found by the search engines. We've promoted it out to our social networks. That's awesome. But you want to know what? We still got to make money somehow. And so the next step of inbound marketing is figuring out how to get that traffic to convert into prospects and leads. Because what you ultimately want to do if you're blogging for business, if you're blogging as part of a company, is figure out how to make money from doing all of this work. Just blogging for, to not make money if you're a business, that's hard. So keys to conversion. It's about creating great content, putting calls to action, and landing pages. So a call to action is just what you see up there. This is a blog, a blog post on the HubSpot blog, 99 ways to generate leads with social media. Let's pretend I tweeted this out and someone clicked on it. They're like, awesome, 99 ways to generate leads on social media. Click, they come here, they read the article, and there's this call to action that's about Facebook for marketing. Hey, ooh, I think I just cut out. <laughs> All right, I'm, I think I'm back. Um, and they're like, hey, look at that. This is really relevant. I'm interested in social media. I'm interested in generating leads from social media. And here's an ebook where I can learn more about it. You know what? I'm going to click on that call to action. And the secret of a good call to action is it needs to be really clear what you want them to do. Download now. I'm not kidding you here. This is easy. Go download it. It's right there. Not a lot of words. Very simple. It's a call to action. That leads them straight to a dedicated landing page. And I say dedicated because you can look at this, it is all about the Facebook marketing update. The text is about it, the picture's about it, there's a form where you can fill it out and download now. But we don't clutter these pages up with a lot of other information. We don't have different offers on this page. We don't even put the navigation on this page at HubSpot. Because what you're trying to do is you're funneling these people into converting. You wanna make it as dead simple to convert for them. You want it to be really easy. They know what they're doing. They just click something very relevant to getting into this landing page. They know why they're here and they're going to take that next step. Now, this has a really long form on it. Um, we found that for HubSpot that still works for us, but that is something to test with because as we all know, long forms, as users, you can look at that and go, oh my god, I have no desire to fill out 14 fields. Um, but it is something to test. There's always a balancing act there of how much information do I get versus how much do I irritate them. And the reason I mentioned that this is a really targeted landing page is because businesses with 40 or more landing pages get 12 times as many leads as businesses with, with one to five. Now this can be for a couple of reasons. A business with 40 landing page probably has a lot of content, right? A lot of different offers there. But it also means that those landing pages are very targeted. Targeted to the individuals, targeted to what they're looking for so they can drive them right in so they know what they're getting. You can use you know, one landing page that looks the same for every offer. It's super easy, it saves you time. You don't have to think about it every time you put a new offer up there. Your conversion rates won't be as high. And so when you've got a new offer, when you've got a new ebook, a new webinar, anything that you're offering and you want them to download or fill out a form for, think about how you can customize that page to make it very relevant for the people you want to convert and relevant for how they're getting to it. So making this work with WordPress. A couple of things. Um, calls to action, CTAs. Um, the HubSpot plug-in made by our very own John Bishop sitting here in the front row. He's famous. 
Uh, <laughs> and he's speaking tomorrow morning. Um, it does really cool calls to action. And what you can do is you can set up a whole bunch of calls to action and then automatically include them in the bottom of your blog posts. So that people read the post and then right at the bottom there's a call to action. If you want to see an example of that, the HubSpot blog does use those so you can see how it's done. Landing pages and forms. Um, there's the WooFu is a very cool uh, form building tool. It has a free version, so you can go and you can build landing pages and forms and then send your traffic there. You could also embed the forms on your WordPress blog. There's also something called Contact Form 7. I haven't used this one myself, but it's a WordPress plugin that allows you to put forms right on your WordPress site. Um, and then again, there are a lot of paid solutions. I only put us there because, well, this is where I work. But um, there are lots of different paid solutions that you can do to get landing pages and forms. And I suggest looking around and seeing if you want to go that approach. Anybody have suggestions on conversion? Yes? Say that one more time. Premise and Gravity Forms, two more plugins that are good. Optimized Press is a paid solution. Excellent, thank you. Wonderful. So that's conversion. So we've talked about creating your content and then you optimize it and you promote it and then you're trying to get people to convert and you've got landing pages and they're driving to your site and they're filling out your forms. And you know what? Pretty soon you're going to be like, I'm doing so much. How do I figure out what's working? And that's where Analyze comes in. We are huge geeks at HubSpot. I'm a total nerd. I love measuring what I'm doing, which I already mentioned once. Because if you're not measuring it, you can't know what's working for you. And again, there are only 24 hours in the day. So you need to figure out what's working and what's not. Um, this is the standard analytics page for WordPress. I haven't met a single WordPress user that actually just uses this. Everybody I know has different plugins for analytics, and every plugin has its own analytics. And so when you talk to people about how they measure their WordPress, there's like a million options. Um, However, so this looks at refers and visits and page views and top posts and those kinds of things. But if you're in marketing, that's not quite enough. If you're trying to make money, you need a little bit more than just knowing who's driving the most traffic to you. You want to look at what's not driving the most visitors, but also what's driving the most leads and customers. And so you look at where is my traffic coming from and where am I getting the most customers from? Because what you're likely to find is some things that drive a lot of traffic to you don't actually convert that well. And other things don't drive a ton of traffic to you, but you get a ton of customers from it. And the only way you can figure this out is by measuring it. You can guess with your gut how it's working, but in reality, you've got to look at the measurements to figure it out. So visitors, leads, and customers. But to take this one step further, you want to look at this by channel. So where's the traffic coming from? I've got some traffic coming from my search engine efforts. I've got some traffic coming from my paid search efforts. I've got social media. I've got all different places where my traffic's coming from. And I can look at how the different channels are performing. Because then if I learn that search engines give me great leads that convert highly, I can spend a little more time focusing on link building and trying to get more links into my site, optimization efforts. Maybe I find out that social media it gets me traffic, but nobody from social media converts. This is one of the things that uh, my dad is an artist, and he has a website, and he gets tons of traffic from StumbleUpon. Tons, like 50% of his traffic is from StumbleUpon. They never buy. They never buy anything. And so he's learned that he actually just doesn't, he discounts StumbleUpon now. He takes that out of his traffic reports because it's never going to help him get any more business. So you want to look at it based on different channel. And then within the channel, you want to look at how things like Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn are performing against each other. So you want to think about visitors, leads, and customers across your channels and within each channel. And making this work with uh, WordPress, there's the Google Analytics plugin. Like I said, there are tons of analytics plugins. I'm, I couldn't even begin to tell you all about the different ones, but there's a Google one that's simple. And for getting the lead customer data, this gets tricky. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything that did it for free. Um, but you can make it work with Google Analytics and a CRM like Salesforce or Sugar or any of those. Um, you can also make it work with HubSpot. I don't know if anybody has suggestions for how to do this that's not paid, but I'm totally open to it. Any, any, any comments on Convert and how you can do this differently? Oh, I'm sorry, on Analyze and how you can do it? All right, an analyzing can get kind of tough. This is tricky stuff, and sometimes you've got to play with it and make sure it's right. Um, and it involves things like you know, Excel spreadsheets and math challenging. So, <laughs> some keys to inbound marketing success. Let's just recap. 
You want to create really compelling content. You want it to be remarkable because you want people to remark on it. You want them to tell their friends. You want them to share it on social media. You want them to link to it. You want to create remarkable content. That's more than content about your product. It's not content about yourself. It's not content that everybody else in your business has. I was recently at Rebar Camp, which is for real estate professionals. And if you're in real estate, your listings, that's not remarkable content. Every real estate agent has listings. That's, you need more than that. You need information on how to buy houses and what the process is going to be and all those questions people have when they're looking, when they're researching buying something like your product. You want to optimize your content and you want to think about both on-page optimization and off-page optimization. You want to think about links and you want to think about making sure your page has the right pieces of information on it to tell Google what your page is about. You then want to promote your content via social media. Um, get it out there. Tell people that your content exists. Get other people to help you and get the compounding effect of social media. You want to convert with calls to action and landing pages. Get those on your site and start getting people to give you their information. Make some money. And then you want to analyze. You always want to analyze and measure what you're doing. Uh, because if you don't, you never know what's going to work. And if it's worth spending your time on contests or on different landing pages or on PPC, whatever it is, you've got to measure. Um, that is the keys to inbound marketing success. It looks like I talked a little bit too long, but we do have time for questions, so, yep. Oh, I think they gave the mic over there, so just one minute. Yeah. Question, Karen. Um, I'm in the process of launching a B2B blog. Yep. At what point in a blog's life cycle does measuring conversions become meaningful? That's a good question. Um, you do need to, uh, yes, you want to get some traffic from it. However, I would also argue at the same time, if you can get this stuff set up early on, then it gives you comparison. You know, whenever you've got data, it's better if you've got lots of time worth of data. If you wait six months and then you start measuring it, you're, you're kind of starting off at a disadvantage because you don't know what happened the last six months. So I'd almost say it, it makes sense to do it right from the beginning because you can never have too much data. Does that make sense? Awesome. There were a couple over here. Yep. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. I think there is one right up here. Yeah. He's coming. I'm a big fan of HubSpot TV. Where's Mike? <laughs> um, Mike's at a wedding today. One of our HubSpotters is getting married, and he's Aww. at her wedding. I really uh, thank love it. Thank you so much. I love it. Friday's at 4. Yeah, we have a live video podcast we do every Friday at 4. If you're from the area, uh, we um, shoot it at our offices and open the doors for anybody who wants to come. There's free beer and uh, networking and hanging out and ping pong. It's generally a decent time. <laughs> Any other questions from the back? Yep, all the way over there. He's on his way to you. If your target clientele is between the search engine optimization group, so they're out there doing the research looking for, for me, but they're not yet into the social media, I'm speaking of seniors yep. uh, in particular, is there a way to get your content out to other blogs or other engines besides just people searching for you yeah, other right. than putting it out on randomly on social media? I would look for other blogs that might be relevant or other websites and offer to do um, guest posts. It's a great way to do it. Um, get some guest posts up there so that you can start getting more inbound links into your site. And from my experience, if you offer to do a guest post and throw a couple different suggestions out there, very few people are going to say, like, no, I don't want free content. Uh, I'm not interested in that. Um, so I would look for ways to drive more links and get your content into other places that are appropriate. Maybe places don't have blogs, um, but they have, you could write an ebook for them. You could generate some content for them that then talks about you, or talks about, drives people to you while being content for them. Um, and I would, I would t try looking at that because links are going to be great for you. I'm getting the two minute sign, so I think I have time for one more question. All right, right here. He, where do you put your blogs on your site? So I know that the previous speaker in here was talking about subdomains versus 
whatever. Um, we do use the subdomain blog.hubspot.com, but like um, she said, it doesn't seem to make a big difference if you do that or backslash blog. I would definitely put you know, a nice big link on your homepage. If you have some top posts, including those is great. Um, and then drive people right to that blog and get them into the content that's going on there. But yeah, absolutely, have a nice big link on your homepage that people see that it's there. Great, thank you so much everybody.